What's going on, everybody? It's Trebe from Trebe Talks here. And the new thing here on Trebe Talks is, is we're going to be having somebody from the Jaguars. No, I wouldn't say media, but, you know, a Jaguars personality on the channel. And my first guest to start this series back up is none other than one of my first original best friends in the Jaguars community, Jason from Jaguars United. How are you doing, brother? Doing good, dude. First guest, dude. That's that's a lot of pressure, man. I man, I I don't know if I can handle it. I'll try though. I'll try. I know, dude. Being a first guest on a Tree Talks <laughs> podcast, Jaguar content. I mean, this is like the pinnacle of of Jaguar media. I mean, you go on Twitter, it's 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 a it's Jaguars United and Tree from Tree Talks, right? This is the this is the pinnacle. It's for real. I feel like people are going to watch this and be like, well, it can't get any worse. So let's just see what other videos Tree has out there. So we'll see. <laughs> no, but um, yeah, I think, I think you've been on a little bit more recently. I'd say probably around six months ago, I'd say you were probably on the channel. And, you know, before that we were doing the, uh, the Madden ratings. And I remember that video was really fun to do. And um, a lot for you has changed. Uh, since then obviously uh, no longer did I introduce you f uh, as Jason from another Jags podcast I don't know if you guys caught on to that but he's starting his own little venture so why don't you tell the people a little bit more about Jaguars United yeah I mean was, we started as the podcast another Jags podcast um, just kind of just to do something we love we love talking about the Jags and then uh, we thought to ourselves at the very beginning we were like we started it because there's like there's nothing that really like brings the fans in at all. You listen to like the uh, the local radio or even some of the, like the online media, and it's like it, nothing really involves the fans. You have to kind of go to Twitter to get your voice out there, and we even all know how then, Twitter that's real is toxic. Yeah, exactly what I'm saying. Like a lot of people don't want to go to Twitter for various reasons. Um, so I love Twitter. I'm all over Twitter. But um, as we started doing the podcast, we noticed people wanted like a forum to kind of talk and to put their views out there. So. I thought, you know what, why not make a forum for Jags fans that's uh, wholesome and that people actually want to go to. So um, we decided to change from another Jags podcast to Jaguars United to kind of unite the fan base. And um, if you haven't been to our website, you know, we have articles now. Um, our apparel store is like launching tomorrow. We're putting a forum on there like next week, so like a message board. Um, so it's going to be like a, a good thing for Jags fans. I'm excited to put some stuff out there. So was this kind of your ideal, obviously you said you wanted something to bring the fans in, kind of involve the fans, but did you really think that this was going to branch out from the podcast to a website, to apparel, to all these things, or did, was it just kind of stroke of luck that this happened? Um, I think it was just, we, like we said, like I said, we wanted to bring the fans into the conversation. And when we did that, we noticed like a huge swell of support from fans because that's what they want. So the, the support was pretty overwhelming um, to the point where people were kind of like wanting us to do it and we're asking for it. So we thought, you know what, let's just keep going with it. You know, it's, it's working. Yeah. So um, that's just what we're going to keep doing. And uh, we love the Jags fan base. Um, it gets a pretty interesting reputation on Twitter and things like that. Um, yeah. But, you know, sometimes Jags fans just want to talk about Jags and not be, you know, bullied, you know, but sometimes it's all they want. Yeah, sometimes sometimes Jags Twitter just just likes to be the bully. Like uh, most recently, I don't know if you've seen the uh, the whole thread and the whole exchange of that Buccaneers fan that said he was the owner of Jags Twitter, and then he ended up getting bullied to deactivate his account. Did you see that? Yeah, I did. I did see that, and that's kind of the part of Jaguars Twitter that's really funny to watch. But there's a a large amount of people that, and they've told me this, that don't really want any part of that type of stuff. They just kind of want to talk about the Jags and, you know, do that sort of thing. So, um, I, that was entertaining. I watched the whole thing <laughs> unfold. I didn't get involved, but I, you know, it was pretty funny to watch. But Jaguars Twitter can be brutal, man. They can they can they can do some damage if they want to. That's for sure. And I mean. Uh... And something that I think you don't get enough credit for is kind of, I think you kind of led the whole way with Jaguar podcasting. I might be tooting your horn, your horn a little bit too much, but I honestly think as far as consistency goes with Jaguar podcasts, um, you guys were one of the first people to do it. 
um, you had guys like me and UCF who did the YouTube stuff. We did the videos and uh, different things every here and there, but you guys with the weekly podcast. And then, you know, you see guys like, uh, I know Duval hot takes the bold take podcast and uh, you know, more, more and more podcasts are coming to uh, fruition now. And uh, you kind of started that wave. And uh, like I said, you know, a big congratulations to you to get to the point to where you are today, for sure. Man, I appreciate that, man. And that's probably more praise than I deserve. Um, but, you know, like I said, I, I, I took a step back and kind of looked at the whole Jaguars media industry and kind of looked at where there was some kind of missing gaps. And we noticed that a, a consistent podcast was missing. Um, podcasts would pop up and then they would disappear. So we thought, you know what, we'll do another Jags podcast. It would be funny because the podcasts pop up here and there. Um, but then the reality of a podcast sets in that it's incredibly hard to be yeah. consistent. It, it, and a YouTuber, it's the same thing. Yeah. Uh, it's really hard to be consistent. And anyone that's thinking about getting into the industry, whether it be podcasts or YouTube, you should definitely do it because we need more grassroots people that have like honest opinions. So get, do it, do a video, do a podcast, but just know going into it, the biggest challenge is going to be consistency and staying like committed to doing it because when life gets in the way, it can be very, very hard. And once you drop off your consistency, you're, you're pretty much gone like everyone else. Yeah. And that's, and I can speak to that into existence. I mean, I, I released a whole video yesterday, a live stream talking about, you know, personal issues that, I had gone through and, you know, kind of prevented me from being as consistent as I used to be. You know, I wasn't the, I put out six days, six videos a week. Ain't nobody at work. Me, them's are just straight facts, tree from tree talks anymore. And, you know, now we're getting back to that grind. And again, uh, really happy to have Jason here from again, Jaguars United formerly as another Jags podcast. And, you know, you've touched a lot on uh, local media. And as far as, you know, the local Jags coverage and how they don't really involve the fans and, you know, things of that nature. What do you think it is about podcasts, about YouTube, that more fans are drawn to that than, say, you know, a guy like Tony Baselli, who's, you know, obviously a front runner to go to Canton someday, has an expert analysis, but they'd rather listen to a guy like, UCF Jaguar, a guy like you, a guy like me. What do you think it is about that fan's perspective that it's more interesting to listen to? Well, I think there's a couple of issues, and it would be hard to kind of pinpoint one thing. I think the biggest issues for the average person like myself is, is like the instant media of it. Like if you turn on the, the radio or if you go to something like that, you have to listen to like five minutes of ads to get anything. Uh, that honestly, to be honest with you, that was the biggest thing that drove me into doing this was I would be in my truck driving to work and I, and I work, I live about 10 minutes from work the entire ride. I would have sports radio on and hear nothing but commercials. And I was like, are you kidding me? I was in my truck for 10 minutes. I didn't hear one thing. It was all commercials. And it would just make me so mad to the point where I was like, you know what? People need stuff that they can get like immediately. And for a long, like, honestly, for a long time, we did it with no ads. We didn't want any ads. We wanted to be like, you know, bottom no ads as it is and then all of a sudden they start throwing some money at us <laughs> yeah. but but we did we talked for yeah. the beginning we yeah. talked about it. you know what we'll sell out immediately if someone offers us a bunch <laughs> of money you did say we'll that sell. i remember the p exact podcast episode when you said that because <laughs> i was um before me and you really became friends and i and i'm glad that you were such a cool a cool dude after that uh i remember i followed you when you had 21 followers and I listened to your first two or three podcasts and you said that in one of them. And you're like, if someone throws the bag at us, we're going <laughs> to just going to go immediately. Yeah. And you guys, and you guys had a really good dynamic as well. So it was, it was always an interesting listen. So I get, I get that side of things for sure. And as you know, doing a podcast, the challenge of the podcast is no one really wants to listen to a podcast of one person talking. No. I mean, they're out there and they're okay, but no one wants to hear one person talking to get that second person to get that third person to show up for a podcast is literally the hardest thing in the world. And that's what makes putting them out consistently tough is getting everyone on the same page of a day. They can all get together. So if you can get over that hurdle, if you're Joe Rogan, you can pay people to come in, then you're good. But uh, Spotify like exclusively us. now though. Yeah, man. But yeah. So I appreciate you having me on and uh, man, I look forward to this off season Jaguar, you know, it, conversations that go on yeah and, and it's crazy times too and just one more question about um you know obviously the 
come up from another Jags podcast to Jaguar United. You kind of gave out your two cents, your tips on people that are trying to start their own uh, individual podcast. What was kind of the moment that you knew you had something there? Like another Jags podcast was a podcast that people were listening to and, you know, had an opportunity to build some revenue and you had an opportunity to build on a following that you had. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I think, you know, we got to, we, the group of guys I was with, and I, I owe a lot of credit to them because they were very, very committed for about a year, two years. I mean, a, a solid year, once a week, we would meet once a week and we would record. And I would say around episode 30, um, I was looking at the numbers of downloads and that's when we really got into like the over a thousand downloads an episode. And then it kind of hit you where it's like, dang, a thousand people are listening to this. Like this is, we probably should take this a little more seriously. So we started, you know, creating an outline for the podcast. We started coming with notes. Um, you know, even that's though we kind of people don't understand is that, um, guys like Jason and like from another Jags podcast, I don't know. I can't speak for UCF in this aspect, but for me too, I came up with video titles. I didn't come up with exactly what I was going to say, outline, you know, nothing. Like if I had a top 10 video, I just wrote down the top 10. But when you get to that, like there's a point where you need to be professional. So there was a time in my YouTube career where I completely felt that. So I just had to interject with that. For sure, dude. I mean, that's the one thing I'm like a, I'm always, I'm kind of like a, not a perfectionist, but I'm like kind of super anal about certain, certain things. So I, I put a video out like every couple of days because I spent a couple of days like prepping for the video, you know? So if you watch any of our videos, um, it's basically me like breaking down film that I've like been watching like for the week, you know, and it's not like something I've just did off the cuff. So I think that's what kind of has allowed me to gain such a, like an accelerated following on YouTube is because when people watch the videos, they're kind of like, Oh crap, this is like, this is pretty deep stuff. This isn't like someone's reaction on their phone, you know? And I think that's, what's kind of helped us a lot. And I got to give you props on that too. Your YouTube growth has been insane. Like, like it reminds me of a young tree talks when I was first starting up. Dude. Hey, you could say, you could say I was inspired even, you know, I was inspired <laughs> by the great tree. <laughs> yeah. Dude. I, I, I watched it. Cause I, I watched, uh, I watched your video of, um, it was Jay, the Jay Gruden video. And I think that ended up getting what? 6,000 views on YouTube. I, I haven't checked it. It's, I mean, it, it's, it's pretty, I mean, every time I check it, it's like, it's popping off. Yeah. And, and like, it's a good, it's a great concept for the video and you put in and, and you know what the funniest thing about this is, cause it's the funniest thing about you as a person too, is you did not expect to take this seriously at all. <laughs> and you don't take a lot of things seriously at all, yeah. but here you are like film study, breaking down everything and now you're you're kind of the professional in the in in the industry sort of obviously not like a hundred percent right but i don't work for nfl network yet but yeah yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> but like but i and honestly like uh it's you know very few people get to catch me off of the recording and i'm a very fun loving guy you yeah. know so <laughs> it's uh sometimes when we... watch another jags podcast one through 30 and like that's that's, <laughs> that's the jason yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah for sure but hey man here we are man we've been here since the beginning i'm just i'm just glad that we're still here yeah treb and jason you always know it's going to be a great video when we get together not to toot our own horns but we probably i'll toot to our own horns man are you kidding me we're the best I you can go anywhere if you, you can go anywhere to hear the same take over and over and over again but you want some originality and some creativity you know where to go yeah, you want you want two people that just feed off of each other better than anybody in the whole community. <laughs> like I mean, fucking look no further than the only the only show better than us two would be you and your ex girlfriend that when you did your YouTube videos when you both would make your score predictions. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you know, this is, that's, the only, that's the only dynamic I see working better than this one. Dude, that's what I'm saying. I mean, fuck. I mean, fuck. I mean, like, in a dating sense, me and you have been together now for about two or three full seasons. <laughs> that's right, man. Hey, sometimes, it's, sometimes there's just sparks, you know? Yeah. Dude, and there, that's another thing, too. Like, uh, I looked back at it the other day, like, just on one random night. 
I don't even know what inspired me to do it, but I was looking at like our own, like our old, old messages, like when I first messaged you. And it was just weird. Like me and you just like fucking click, like right off the bat. Like, <laughs> hey, you know, that's how it goes, man. That's how it goes. Goon squad, really. It's just, <laughs> the personalities click. And, 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 and it's rare for me to, like, I get excited anytime I just, I meet a Jags fan. Because, you know, living in Idaho, I don't live in the Florida area. I don't just run into Jags fans on the daily. So I think that helps a lot, just running into a, a Jags fan. And and like we talked about earlier, too, I mean, fucking A, the, the fan base, that it just is everywhere. Like, and, yeah, and absolutely. It's, a, it's a small group total, but, like, people are everywhere. Like, you get, like, Idaho, the U.K., like, Patrick Jackson. I already know you're watching this. I don't even need to shout (laughs) you out. I know you're watching My dog. (laughs) Yeah, and he's, like, our biggest fan. We were talking about that earlier before we were – I got got a shirt going coming up, going out to P-Jack. P-Jack. P-Jack's on the list of free apparel. That's where P-Jack is at. Dude, who – you got got somebody doing your apparel? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I got a – I got a guy who – a uh, guy I've actually been friends with for a long time. He's got a t-shirt printing company. Oh, they make really? t-shirts. And so he was, I was able to get a really good deal. I mean, you're basically getting, I mean, our shirts, you can get our shirts for like uh 14 bucks. You can get a, you can get a tank top for like 15 bucks. And uh, it just says Jags United on it. And it's funny because you were talking about like, you don't live in Idaho. You don't live in Jackson or you don't live in Jacksonville. Whenever I wear our shirt out, like I'm always like, Oh man, people are going to come talk to me about the Jags. Cause every time they come and talk about the Jags, it's just like, always the weirdest person ever and they have the most weirdest take and i'm like yeah man like that's Isn't an that interesting weirdest, point of view <laughs> that's the weirdest part about being like a personality i yeah. think i think that's the weirdest part because people will come up to you like you should see some of my dms sometimes <laughs> people saying like hear me out we signed blake bortles back <laughs> competes with gardner takes the job we go nine and seven <laughs> seventh seed and it's like what <laughs> why is it's, this so specific <laughs> it's insane like they'll come up to you and then they'll just be like yeah man i just can't stand mike malarkey man he's just running the ball into the into the dirt and doesn't ever throw the ball doesn't let Gardner throw it i'm like you realize mike malarkey not hasn't been the coach since like 2011 right and like and, and, it, and it's just like okay but you know, look, we're for the people. So we'll be like, I'll be like, yeah, man, I'll let them talk and let them hear their point of view. And, uh, you know, what's good is a lot, there's a lot of passion out there. I was actually looking at the, the, uh, the attendance records for teams and the Jags were 22nd. That's pretty good. Like in a league of 32 for like Jacksonville, like, uh, you know, they're the smallest the market. market. Size, yeah. They're the smallest market in the NFL. I mean, they're down there in market size and they're 22nd on attendance. And the team was terrible. Like the team was horrible, awful, nothing to watch. And we're 22nd. That actually says a lot about Jacksonville. And that's why we have some of the most passionate fans for sure. And, and that's where I kind of want to start things off and start things uh, with this conversation. Um, something that I never get tired of talking about is the Jaguars quarterback, Gardner Minshew. Now Gardner Minshew met with the local media, another group that we were talking about earlier <laughs> um, today. And he had some, he had some things. And when Gardner talks to the media, he he has it together. He oh, yeah. ta- he talks like he's a starting quarterback. I actually interviewed Gardner Minshew when he went to Washington State. A couple of pressers. He's a very well put together guy. Uh, were you able to catch the press conference or at least some cliff notes from it from earlier today? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, you pretty much can read it on Twitter. I, mean, I feel like it's yeah. the Matrix. I'm just scrolling through reading what happened in reality, but pretty much read the whole thing, the the transcripts from it. Mm-hmm. And and I think one thing that I really enjoy about him is he's not backing down from a challenge. You know, when Blake Bortles was kind of questioned by the media and everybody's like, Blake, there's no doubt about it. Like everybody says you suck and Blake be like, maybe I do suck, you know, but with, <laughs> with Gardner Minshew, he steps in and says the only thing that matters is everybody in this locker room and we have a lot to prove this year. Um, what are your expectations? What are your thoughts of Gardner Minshew heading into the 2020 campaign so far? Yeah, I mean, I think you put it pretty well there. Um, the thing that Minshew gets talked about all the time about him is that he's a leader. And like the second he walks into the room, like he's a leader. So like hearing that that's his response is not surprising to me because that's what everyone says about him. And that's kind of one of his best attributes 
is that he is a leader. He steps in as a leader. I mean, he, he stepped in and was a leader his rookie year. Like, think about that. Like, was Kyler Murray the, the leader of the Cardinals? Was Daniel Jones the leader of the Giants? Like, probably not. Those guys don't seem like they have the personality to step into the huddle and be a leader. But Minshew is like, oh, yeah, dude, that dude is leading this crew into battle. And, like, you say that immediately about Gardner Minshew. And that's one of the things I love about him. And I think he has something like the it factor that is going to allow him to take this Jaguars team to an eight or nine win season. And I know that's crazy, but I think honestly, eight or nine win season, I think Minshew leads them to this year. So one thing that you, you were talking about is, you know, his leadership ability and, you know, he's the leader of the team and you look at guys like Kyler Murray, Daniel Jones, those aren't the leaders of the team because you got guys like Saquon Barkley, Larry Fitzgerald that are on the team, but Minshew, DJ Chark's not a thousand yard receiver with Blake Bortles. He wasn't. And DJ, and I'm not taking anything away from DJ Chark. Don't take that the wrong way. But Gardner Minshew comes in there. There's a thousand yard receiver in DJ Chark, and he's leading the team. And he's always had that kind of chip on his shoulder. As you know, if you just read my Twitter bio, I was a Gardner Minshew fan before it was cool. You go into Washington State, he had the, almost the exact same situation. He wasn't really supposed to be the starting quarterback. Tyler Holinsky, the guy that was going to be the quarterback, uh, ended up committing suicide and led Washington State to its best regular season record in program history and dominated and just electrified the fans and electrified the community. And he's doing that exact same thing in Jacksonville. And that's why I think I, I find it hard to believe that – you know, it, it's, it's, it's a tale of two different communities when you go to Jaguar Facebook and you go to Jaguar Twitter. Jaguar Facebook is a very firm believer of the tank for Trevor train. There's no way, in my opinion, absolutely no way Gardner Minshew can ever, ever be that bad to the point where they are going to be in a position to draft Trevor Lawrence in 2021. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, 100%. I mean, if you, we saw last year, this team could be the worst team in the NFL for three and a half quarters. It can be the worst team. They could give up 200 yards rushing to the worst running back in the league. But in the final half of the fourth quarter, Gardner Minshew is going to do what he does. And he's going to yeah. win you at least six games. And that's just the way that he's going to do it. I, I agree 100% with you. There's no way a Gardner Minshew-led team is going to be the first, the worst team in the league. It's just – it's not – he's clutch he's got the clutch gene he's got the it factor if he doesn't win eight or nine wins like I'm saying there's no way he wins only four I mean you still got Leonard Fournette you still have DJ Chark you st I mean you have no defense but you can you know you could still win yeah. some games with that <laughs> yeah and and you know a lot of people immediately are going to Dave Caldwell and Shad Khan that is I think that is the trickiest subject you could even talk about as a Jaguar presenter, as somebody in the Jaguar media, because there's some, like, every bit of you wants to go off on these two men and say that they have depleted this franchise, they have done everything bad, but then you look back at it and you say, well, maybe there's this, and maybe there's that, and maybe there's this. Why is it so hard to talk about Shad Khan and Dave Caldwell? Um, as it, as it is to the team success. I mean, think I, Dave Caldwell has gotten an unprecedented leash as far as time he's had to develop a team. I mean, yeah. no one in history has been giving like what, seven years to build a team. Um, I, I, Dave Caldwell has a very good reputation amongst NFL circles. So like if, if you go and talk to these like high execs and these GMs, Dave Caldwell has a good reputation amongst those groups. That's why Khan has allowed him to stay. Um, Khan is a smart businessman and if everyone in the industry is talking highly of your guy you're not going to fire him and that's just Shad Khan being a smart businessman regardless of how you feel about the Jags if you stack on top of that the fact that he's found these gems here and there um, then you could make a case that having him retained is going to give you the same chance of winning as bringing in someone fresh so you know why not give him another year give Minshew earned another year to prove that he could be a franchise guy so this is it this is it for all of them it's all it's tough it's a lot of weight on Minshew and I think he can handle it but this entire organization is resting on Gardner Minshew if Gardner Minshew has a good year this year everyone's retained we're moving forward let's go if Gardner Minshew has a bad year we're cleaning house 
drafting a new quarterback and we're starting over in 2021. So let me put it to you like this. Let's say Gardner Minshew goes out and does what me and you expect him to do at the very least. Let's say he wins seven football games next year and the Jaguars are good enough to finish second, second, we'll say second in the AFC South. Because the AFC South, at least in my opinion next year, I don't think is going to be a powerhouse division. I don't know what you think about that, but in my opinion, I don't think they're going to be a powerhouse division. Now, the Jaguars go 7-9 and nine in the AFC South Dave Caldwell, does that change his reputation a little bit? Does he flip it to where he can get a little bit more respect and there's a little bit more understanding to the leeway, but there's still a losing record at hand? You know, what is the extension that you're going to be giving Dave Caldwell with a Gardner Minshew-led team? So I hate – and I never use this response ever. I, this is my most hated response. When, when I'm interviewing people, I'm talking to people, and they give me this response – I always get pissed and I pick at them, but this is the honest truth. It depends how that seven and nine looks. Okay. If Gardner Minshew is balling and the defense can't stop anybody, I think we have something and the defense gets older. We draft some defensive players then, okay, we're okay. We're good to go. If we're like barely winning games, Minshew plays horrible. You know, uh, the backup quarterback comes in and wins three or four games. Then, then that's obviously a rebuild. So like I said, it, it would be hard for me to draw a line in the sand as far as wins and losses, because it depends on how it looks. And I think the looking deciding factor is going to be how well these newest players play, <laughs> which is tough yeah. for a GM, but that's um, I think cause Khan's a businessman. Like I said, he's going to evaluate that. And then he's going to be like, all right, you're either we're moving the direction we want to go or we're not. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we talk about Dave Caldwell getting this long leash to really build this team seven years, however long it's been. Now we flip the switch to uh, to uh, Doug Marone. Doug Marone has also been kind of given this long leash, but it seems like Jaguar fans aren't as hard on Doug Marone. Because I feel, I, I feel like when you look at Doug Marone coach a football game, he looks like he ages 60 years during the football game he does not look like he is having a good time coaching those guys out there um as far as Doug Marone goes I think Doug Marone is poised to have a bounce back season this year especially with a guy that I know you like and a guy I know is going to translate well and we're going to talk about him more and more as this podcast goes along but with Jake Rudin and Ben McAdoo too Ben McAdoo doesn't get talked about as much as a quarterback coach, but I really like that signing as well. Um, now that we've talked about Shad Khan, we've talked about Dave Caldwell. Um, you know, what is Doug, where does Doug Marone stand with the seven and nine? Is this a Jason Garrett situation where he's going to be sticking around if this team is mediocre to average, or is it a situation where you need to find your guy now? There's no point in keeping Doug around, or are you going to go back to that answer of it depends on how it looks? Yeah, so that's a tough question because what a coach is asked to do is to be the CEO of an organization. Um, so there's things that you can do as the CEO of an organization um, that doesn't translate to wins, but that's good. And so what I mean by that is Doug Marone isn't one of these guys who like Jake Rudin or these guys who called their own place, right? Or who was very, very aggressive in the play calling and the scheme. Doug Marone is one of those coaches that's in the category of, what a typical special teams coach would look like when they get a head coaching job. It's very just like, all right, look, I'm going to manage the timeouts. I'm going to manage the, the replays. I'm going to manage the when we go for it on fourth down, when we don't. I'm going to manage – And I think he does a good job at those like. things. Yeah. Exactly, and, and that's the problem. Is he, he's very good at those things, but he doesn't get wins. So he's kind of in that bubble where it's like when everyone gets the boot or if everyone gets the boot, he's going to be lumped in, but – Doug Marone's a great guy, but he doesn't move the needle for the team very much. Like, for example, I think Jay Gruden is a bigger part of the Jaguars' wins and losses than Doug Marone is. Mm -hmm. And that's just because Jay Gruden's calling plays for the offense, and Doug Marone's, like, calling timeouts. So, yeah, there's a lot that comes with being a head coach, but um, I, I think he's just kind of lumped into the organization. He doesn't really move the needle that much for me. So, and uh, that's one person and one thing I really want to talk to you about is Jay Gruden. 
mostly because I was having a conversation with Fitz the other day for all my loyal uh, crew cast listeners. Uh, you'll know who that is, my best friend of 10 years. And we got into a little bit of a heated debate the other day. He said, um, Jay Gruden is a terrible coach. <laughs> And that, you know, what did he do in Washington? He did absolutely nothing. Mm, and, yeah. you know, you know what I did? I sent him right over to Jaguars United. <laughs> you said, and, watch this. I'll change your mind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I showed him that and it kind of changed his mind a little bit. You know, um, what is it? Because I wasn't really buying into Jay Gruden until i and this is like this is me patting you on the back this that's, is me patting you on the back that's what we up. do <laughs> Straight up, dude because i didn't know too much about jay gruden but when i when i like you know learned about what he was and who he is as a coach you know i really liked the addition with him especially with a young quarterback like gardner Minshew. so for those people that are watching on tree talks that aren't subscribed to Jaguars United, which you should be, uh, tell everybody why they should be excited about Jay Gruden as the offensive coordinator. Tree, I've always kept it real with you when I'm on your show. Um, I love your channel because you kind of get the real me. And I'll be honest with you, um, I do kind of side with the more optimistic side on my channel. Um, I'm an optimistic guy. I live my life that way. That's just, that's just what I do. When I made the video, I wanted to highlight the good things that he did which I did. Um, but I'm not all sunshine and rainbows. I always am honest and I always put some critiques of the person in the video as well. So if you watch the video, you saw the little blurb about what, you know, his little drawbacks or some things he may need to fix or address. I personally think Jay Gruden will be pretty good here in Jacksonville. And I think he'll be good enough to keep the job and move it forward because here's the honest truth. This may be the best team Jay Gruden has ever had. Like, think about it. In Cincinnati, like, they made the playoffs, and they were good. They had A.J. Green and Andy Dalton and Tyler Eifert and guys like that. But uh, they didn't, never won a playoff game. They never won – you know, they never, once they got there, they never won a playoff game. Washington, they have never had a successful team since, like, the, the, the 80s. Like, then they brought in, like, Steve Spurrier, Jim Zorn, Joe Gibbs. They brought in, like, legends. And no one can be successful there because the owner – um, and the GM always overstepped their boundaries. Um, so I don't fault him for not being successful in Washington because nobody is successful in Washington, literally nobody. So I think he'll be good. This might be the best team he has. He runs the ball a lot. That's one thing I think people are going to have to get used to is like, he's going to run Fournette to the ground again. And he's going to use, he's going to run Chris Thompson to the ground out of the backfield. Raquel Armstead is going to get a lot of snaps. Like he keeps it tight. He likes to run the ball and he likes to play action and throw it deep. And, if you're a bad team, that that is really boring to watch. <laughs> I'm just gonna put it out there. Well, so. that's 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 if this offense, you know, ends up tanking. But if this offense plays to its strengths, and I I don't know if you saw my tweet from eh, probably a month ago now. I I am done, and I will no longer stand for any Leonard Fournette slander. I will not stand for it. I will absolutely positively not stand for it. And Jay Gruden, Leonard Fournette loves Jay Gruden. Do I know that for a fact? No, but he's going to. <laughs> he's going to love Jay Gruden just purely off of play style. And there are some guys that came to Jacksonville because they liked Jay Gruden and they liked how he called plays. Tyler Eifert, Chris Thompson. Chris Thompson, in an interview when he came to Jacksonville, got a little emotional talking about how much he really liked uh, Jake Rudin and, and, you know, was a big reason why he decided to come to Jacksonville. And Gardner Minshew is successful off of play action, and he was accurate on the deep ball, which is just – it's just so funny to me because that was the biggest thing I will never forget coming out of college. Uh, and even in the pre – well, like Gardner had probably historically one of the worst preseasons and. Jaguar history. I don't know if you'll remember that. I don't even remember what game it was when he got hit so hard his helmet came off. You remember that? Oh, yeah. That was preseason. Yeah, preseason. He had, like, yeah, the worst yeah. preseason yeah. in, like, Jaguar history. Like, it, yeah. was, it was one of the worst that I've ever seen. But, you know, you get in a guy that is going to fit a guy like Gardner Minshew, then this is going to be a very, uh, very successful team. And – You've seen what happens when players that are on this team want to play for this team. 2017, whether, you know, 
all the things that happened after the fact aside, that was a team that wants to, that wanted to play for each other. And how much of that do you think plays an impact uh, in the 2020 season? I think that's a huge impact. And I think that's something that championship and championship teams that make a run all have. Um, with the Jaguars being so young, it's hard to see where that's there. Um, especially with like your veteran leaders not wanting to be there with Ngakwe or, you know, things like that. So um, I think that's a huge part of it. And I think we'll get there eventually. Um, man, this, I don't think this team's far from being good. I think they're middle of the road right now and they're so young, which is good. You know, I'll take that, man. I mean, I think they're going to have some issues at safety. Uh, and I think that they might have some issues at corner. So I think three of their four defensive backs could be suspect. Um, I'm hoping they're not. And Trey Herndon is actually a huge fan. Shout out Trey Herndon. Um, is he really? But, absolutely. And he's all over our stuff. And, uh, and we love Trey Herndon, but, you know, we just we want to hopefully move this defense forward. And I'm afraid they're a couple pieces away. How do you feel about the signing of Joe Schobert? Uh, that's Jason from another Jags <laughs> podcast. We, we are on the same level because I was just about to ask you, about Joe Schobert. Let me tell you, I have a friend uh, named Austin. We call him Gary and we call him Barnage because he's a Browns fan. And uh, now, and like people around town actually think his legitimate name is Barnage. I think <laughs> Barnage in Lewiston, Idaho is more known than Gary Barnage is. And that's just like, if you go around Lewiston, no one's going to know Gary Barnage. They're going to know Gary Barnage from Lewiston, Idaho. They're not going to know the football player, but I don't know the football player or the city, so I'm yeah. totally just have no idea. You don't know Gary Barnage, the old tight end from the Browns, dude. Oh yeah, 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 yeah dude, okay. he, dude. Like he is he significant? Like is he? Is a, <laughs> I, I, he's, he's like a thousand I, yard receiver. Him okay, and Angelo Williams have a podcast. <laughs> okay, all right. It's like all right, cho- all right. it's literally called like chocolate mocha or something like that. Oh, okay. So they're just definitely just all right, all right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I know Gary Barnes. Yes, I do know. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. But anyway, he's a huge Browns fan. And one player that Barnage will always hype up is Joe Schober. And he hyped him up so much. And when the team let him go, that was a big, big, you know, sad moment for him. And I got to watch a lot of Browns games. I watch a lot of Browns football. And Joe Schobert is a top three middle linebacker in the NFL. Wow. And the Jacksonville Jaguars got so, so lucky. And it's almost and, – and I don't mean to just say this because it's a white middle linebacker or whatever, <laughs> but it's, it's almost very, like, similar to Paul Puzlesny when he first came into Jacksonville. So Paul Puzlesny was an anchor of a Buffalo Bills – defense he was the star player he ran the defense he led the defense and he was a big part of that and he had teams like New England interested in him that wanted him to play for a championship defense but he decided to come to Jacksonville and play for us and then you know obviously a 2017 season happened but it's almost exactly how it was with Joe Schobert. Me and Jason uh, Taylor, who's my buddy, we did a podcast earlier, and we were talking about it like Baltimore was interested in Joe Schobert. That's a championship team. That's a championship defense. And this guy, pound for pound, leadership, run defense, and in, against the pass. He had four interceptions last year. This is a top three middle linebacker in the NFL. How do you feel about Joe Schobert? Yeah, I mean, I watched a lot of his film when he was at Cleveland, and he definitely stood out as being um, a very, very good linebacker. Um, hard to compare him because I haven't seen, like, I guess the entirety of the NFL. He looks really good. I mean, he does remind me – I mean, he's, he's more athletic than Puzz. I mean, yeah. they're both white, but, I mean, Schobert is, like, really, really athletic. A lot of people, like, point to his, like, coverage skills as being his strength. And they are yeah, the four picks. Yeah. For, for a middle linebacker, they, they really are, but it's nothing that's going to like, like, like when I went back and watched his film, like he, he like would just drop in coverage and the guy would catch the ball behind him and he would just make the tackle. And like, he was there and he made the tackle and he was like on the hip, but he wasn't like a, you know, KJ Wright type of guy, like yeah. everywhere, you know, like, so like really his best attrib- attribute on film, this looks like he kind of knows where the play is going before it happens. And he's kind of like a step ahead, which is great. And I love about that, about Joe Schobert. Um, 
the football I, oh, IQ is huge. And I think that's kind of why the, the Puzz comparison to me, because I thought that's like, even like when Puzz was getting slower, I thought like his football IQ was like a huge reason why he'd be in on some plays that he would make. And I think that's kind of very similar to Joe Schober. His football IQ is huge. It's hot, very high. Yeah, the thing that stood out to me the most about Schubert on his film was his ability to not get caught up in what's called like the window dressing and basically like think of like a counter run play where like everything's moving one direction, but the ball is actually going the other direction. Like a linebacker's ability to kind of see through that is very valuable. And that's what Schubert has. Like so many times they tried misdirection, play actions, and Schubert never bought in on what they were doing he never was out of position always had his guy on lockdown even though he wasn't as athletic as some of these like slot receivers or tight ends he was there and he knew what was going on and that's huge and it seems like with the Jags last year like it, it, it was just like missed tackle or broken play which are the two most frustrating things when you're watching a defense because it's like that's a mental error like a missed tackle in a in a broken play that's not like on the coach that's not on like the, the scheme that's on you just being like dumb you know and that's what's the most frustrating yeah and I think a lot of the uh the broken plays and you know the explosive plays that happened for the Jaguars I think had to do with like injury on the side of on that side of things because I mean you have like guys like Austin Calitro playing middle linebacker and that's not ideal for anybody yeah but that's no excuse though because I mean you see te- every team deals with injuries Every single team. No team's exempt. Yeah, I mean, some teams get hurt more than others, but no team is exempt from injuries, and you have to be able to scout and sign the guys that you could plug in to be serviceable. And the Jags didn't do that last year. Yeah, and and to your point, that's fair, and I would agree with that. And I think the Joe Schobert signing is a huge step in the right direction as to signing guys that they need to have in their locker room to compete. Um but to that point as well, I don't think they really did a good enough job doing that with a position that was a very glaring need in my eyes, and that's a safety position. I don't think they put in enough effort to improve the safety position. Not that there were, you know, some people in the draft or even really in free agency that were, you know, head over heels, like crazy, insanely great talents. But I mean, you have opportunities to make like maybe a blockbuster move like a Jamal Adams maybe but they're just they're really not trying to improve that position and you know you brought it up earlier you know what's what are your thoughts on the safety position safety is one of those positions that um, because it's like so deprioritized as far as like on the salary cap like if you're designating a percentage of your salary cap per position safety is going to be like toward the bottom of the list. So because of that, on some teams, you end up with like a disgustingly bad secondary safety situation. And you can still make a run with that. Like you think back to some of the Chiefs teams where when they, when Eric Berry was injured, you think back to um, these Patriot teams that before Devin McCourty, you know, they were running around with some of these guys that, you know, didn't really – weren't, like, top-tier guys. And because of that, I think that position gets, like, kind of watered down. And so you're like, yeah, you got Jared Wilson and you got Ronnie Harrison. And we kind of play a scheme where we're usually in just, like, a cover three. So you could get away with just having one guy and that can play free safety. Uh, I could see where that position becomes a concern. And it is a concern for me, but – uh, the NFL now is about scoring points and you have to be able to out, you have to be able to put 35 on a team. Like that's, you get to the first round of the playoffs or you get to the Super Bowl. If you can't put 35 on the team, you're not going to win. And I think that's where the NFL is moving. And so it's like, okay, the safety position isn't going to help us put 35 on the board. Um, so let's just kind of get a guy in the cheapest possible way we can. I would agree with that for sure. Now let's, let's keep talking about the secondary and let's talk about, a guy that is no longer on the Jacksonville Jaguars, a guy who says he is not worried about any money whatsoever, and that is, of course, Jalen Ramsey. And Jalen Ramsey, by saying he did not care about the money, was a very bold thing to say after showing up in the Brinks truck to training camp literally a season prior. Um, What are your thoughts on Jalen Ramsey's contract situation in Los Angeles? I know obviously it's not a Jags conversation anymore, but 
Do you think he's in line to become the highest paid corner in NFL history? Um, I think that just, just for some like back knowledge, some side story ness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, Jalen Ramsey, hands down, was one of my favorite athletes of all time. I love Jalen Ramsey. I'm not a big Florida State guy, but I just loved everything about Jalen Ramsey. I own probably three or four jerseys of Jalen Ramsey. They used to be on the wall behind me, but had to take them down for obvious reasons. My Wi-Fi password is Ramsey, but the A is an at sign, and the S is a money sign, right? I was all in on Jalen Ramsey. My okay. first cat that me and my ex-girlfriend got, we named it Ramsey. I, <laughs> yeah. Ramsey stung the Jaguar heart more than any other player in Jaguar history. I'm thinking back when Mark Brunell got, you know, released, everyone was like, oh man, he was good, but uh, you know, whatever. When, that was a baby. Yeah. when Fred Taylor got released, got released and signed by the Patriots, everyone was like, oh, that kind of stung. Nothing stings more than Jalen Ramsey saying, I went out of Jacksonville. And everyone had jerseys. Everyone was a big fan. We loved him. He was on ESPN all the time. I think the dude is one of the best. Cor- he, I think he's the number one best corner in the NFL. I'll come out and say it. I know he didn't have a great year last year. He's the best corner in the NFL. C.J. Henderson reminds me a little bit of Jalen Ramsey, and that's why I'm so pumped about C.J. Henderson. That's a side conversation, but I love Jalen Ramsey. I think he, his prototype, great in the run game, great in the press game, can play in zone, can play man, can play anything you need him to do. Aggressive, hits hard, talks smack. That's what you want. He's prototypical Deion Sanders in modern-day NFL, and, and – C.J. Henderson, it kind of reminds me of him a little bit. And that's why I'm so big on Henderson. I think Ramsey becomes the highest-paid DB in the league, um, and he deserves it. That's, that's going to be crazy for the Rams, man. Because, I mean, the Rams – I'm not saying by the Rams, okay? Maybe not the Rams. You Maybe don't you – don't, well, okay, don't, that's another conversation. Yeah, exactly. I, it's going to be the Rams? I mean, you got to be kicking yourself if you trade a first-round pick and don't re-sign him. But I think, dude, the Rams might prioritize his contract. If they can unload golf somehow, then – they may prioritize that contract because Ramsey, like I said, is like an all pro consistently every year. Yeah, for sure. And that's, and that's what I, and that's what I'm saying too, is like, it would be insane if the Rams didn't sign back Jalen Ramsey, like Jalen, Jalen would have got screwed by two teams. And then at that point, you almost, even as a Jags fan kind of got to start feeling bad for Jalen Ramsey. It's like, you know, I don't feel bad for that fool. Are you kidding me? He's going to be he's going to be a top paid DB somewhere. I don't feel bad for him. He knows his worth. He didn't want to be in Jacksonville. He started running his mouth to get out of Jacksonville. And Gakwe is doing the same thing. And it, it is what it is, you know. I don't think Ngakwe has the same value that Jalen brings. And I know and I know and I know that if we had the same exact conversation a year ago, it would be me saying something completely different. But I think what Yan has done on social media and how far he has really drugged this out, I don't think Yan's going to be getting top five pass rusher money. By an no, I mean, the news came out today where J.J. Watt basically said that he's not going to pursue a contract extension and he's okay with basically $16 million a year for the next two years. That crushed Jan's entire camp like yes. the best d end in the league that everyone is maybe not like on stats but perceived by the national media the best defensive end in the league basically came out and said ah, i'm worth 16 let me prove my worth next year killed Clowney, killed Ngakwe, it killed all of them and honestly look i'm glad because you're right ramsey is way better than Ngakwe. and if you go back to our early episodes we used to mess around because we started this debate, Dante Fowler versus Yannick Ngakwe, a long time ago because we kind of saw the writing on the wall. And I would always – I always said something about Ngakwe just isn't right with me. I would take it Fowler. I would take Fowler. And then I would always be the punching bag and get all that. But I'm telling you, for years I've said something about Ngakwe just has been like a little – and I've heard from some people that are close to the situation – that something about the something about him has always been a little like off. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And we're kind of seeing it now. So, you know, I wish the best for Ngakwe. I honestly wish the best for Ramsey. Like they both, they both wanted to get out of Jacksonville, but they didn't want to look like the bad guy. So they blamed the front office. That's the bottom line. Accept it how you want. Take it how you want. That's what happened. So okay, I got 
I got a question, but first I want to tell you about a video I made uh, during like my six day a week grind and I was just making, you know, videos about anything. I made a video titled, who would you rather have long-term Jalen Ramsey or Yannick Ngakwe? And that video did not age well at all. And I just wanted to bring that up. I mean, that's a lose lose. I mean, just by the title, I feel like there's no winners in that video at all. Dude, That was before the trade. That was before <laughs> everything, dude. Like, Dude, and everybody okay. in the comments, you read the comments back, everybody's like, both. They could do both. They could do both. <laughs> YouTube, YouTube comments are the black hole of the world, dude. Yeah. YouTube comments, I, I stopped going on them because I just was like, well, what am I even looking at? I, YouTube, we love YouTube comments. We'll read them and stuff. But, uh, man, golly, some people just, I don't know what's going on in the YouTube comments. That's all I'm going to say well, about that's, that. That's facts, too, because, like, so, like, when I was first started, like, making it and, like, my – you know, following got built. I tried to make an effort to prioritize to reply to those comments. And like, after a while, dude, some of them just got to the point where it was like, this is just, this is too much. I can't, I can't respond to these, to these comments. I was doing a film breakdown and I just like not giving my opinion, just like saying what's happening and things like that. And then this guy was like, comes in the comments he's like oh this dude sucks at film breakdowns he has no idea what he's talking about and i was like i legit it wasn't even like giving my opinion i was just telling you like pass play like literal, literal <laughs> yeah, like, he runs a slant here he catches the ball right like, i wasn't like like and i just was like man like what did this guy see that made him think that because i'm watching a different video than him yeah but that was just one guy most i don't want to you know talk too bad about our channel it's most, no, no, no. Of, most of the it. comments are good but just the one guy, i was like what dude, what's this is this is why people listen to our podcast jason because we get sidetracked and we start and we start talking shit about our own fans you know what i mean <laughs> yeah seriously hey let me ask you a question yeah what's up let me hear it all right where would you put your okay let's take all of the jaguar fan fandom together where would you okay so the people that live in jacksonville are pretty like loud and vocal mm -hmm. where would you on that scale where would you put the people of like london london i mean well that's the i i know one i really know one guy really well in london you were you were talking earlier about how you thought like you had more of a base in london and you may know more people in london that follow the jags but like I don't, and I know Patrick Jackson, obviously, second so shout out to him, but he deserves it. And, <laughs> and freaking, um, you know, and it's like the Jags lost those two games in London and you didn't really hear anything from like the London community about it. And, you know, so I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't say that it's as comparable. I wouldn't compare it really. I would, I would say that it's actually – it's not, not that it's comparable because obviously the city that you're in is going to be way more. But yeah. I was surprised by the amount of um, participation from the London crowd and Twitter. We had these people that were constantly asking questions and giving input and putting their opinions out there that I thought were actually really good opinions. So I kept talking about them. I kept putting them out there. And as time went on, I'm like, dude, a bunch of these guys are like from the UK. And yeah. I'm like, holy crap, like this fan base has grown – like, like we actually have a pretty concentrated pocket in London of fans. And so like we're in Jaguars media and I've noticed from my stuff, like my London participation and interaction online is like pretty high up there. Like it's, it was surprising. I'm not saying it's, it's the same, but I'm saying it was like, it definitely stood out. And I was like, Whoa, like, like what, like people aren't going to want to hear this. this. People are not going to want to hear this. What shot Khan and doing is doing in London is actually might be working as far as raising the Jaguar fandom in that area. And I would say to that, you're spitting a hundred percent facts. Like people don't want to hear that, but it's what we said earlier, you know, Shad Khan's a businessman. That's what he is at the end of the day and what he's doing for business, for marketing, everything in between. I think he's doing a good job too. Yeah, I mean, people are like, he doesn't know football. He doesn't claim to know football. He's not, yeah. he's not claiming to be Jerry Jones, like, calling the plays. He's like, yeah, you're right. 
I hired Tom Coughlin because everybody in Jacksonville at the time was like, hire Tom Coughlin. He's available. Yeah, exactly. He's coming off of two Dude, Super Bowls. That's, that's what I don't get is like people want to hate on Tom Coughlin all you want and you can, and I get it, and I really do. I really do. It was <laughs> shitty. I hated it too. I'll never forget I was recording a Jaguar Maven podcast with John when he got fired. And like we had to stop it, and like it was, I just remember that. But, <laughs> but like everybody wanted that. There's not a single fan in the world that was not hyped about that move. Exactly. I mean, people before the move was made was like everyone was like, hire Coughlin. Coughlin's available. Coughlin's hard nosed. He's gonna hold these these players accountable, and these players that are doing their own thing. He's gonna we're we'll get back on Coughlin time, and everyone was all hyped about Coughlin. And then it was like, oh, how dare you hire Tom Coughlin? How could you do that? And it's like, like if, if people could just like back the scope up and look at what the perception was of the team then, we were no good before Coughlin. We had Gus Bradley and Mike Malarkey and Jack Del Rio with some we bad years. I mean, it's just like if you're like what I always tell people is I was like, if you were Shot Con, you would have hired Tom Coughlin too. And that's the bottom line. And he was terrible and Coughlin was horrible, and he gave us a horrible reputation. The NFLPA sent out stuff saying don't sign in Jacksonville, which is as bad as it gets. Yeah. But we still got Joe Schobert. We still got Tyler Eifert. You know, we got Norwell to restructure his deal, meaning he wants to be Which is great, here. by the way. I think Absolutely. About that. Great move. So, it's, you know, we'll see. I mean, who would we have missed out on if the NFLPA didn't put that out there? I think people like coming to Florida and playing golf and fishing. If you look at Tyler Eifert's – Twitter all his posts are from fishing and and playing golf like he's rubbing it in his former teammates face yeah for real no one you can't do that in Ohio it's snowing <laughs> in Ohio <laughs> but um that I'm glad you brought up Andrew Norwell's contract actually because I I talked to uh Jason the other Jason about that on another podcast um and I told him like Andrew Norwell is actually a pretty good football player like that's I hope so. that's all i'm saying because well you would you wouldn't think that from the slander he gets on the internet but he's actually a pretty good football player and and my buddy uh fitz larry that i was talking about earlier um he sent me an article like a thousand word article about how people need to like lay off andrew norwell because he performed really well in pass blocking and it was mostly you know against the run and this guy goes back restructures his contract gets the incentives and I think Andrew Norwell next year by the end of 2020 is going to be one of the candidates for most improved player next year what do you think about Andrew Norwell? I think that you are wrong really and I would love to see the article that tries to uh, defend Andrew Norwell and look I'm the last person to ever uh, hate on someone or to get down on someone. That's not the way I do things. But statistically speaking, and from the film, Andrew Norwell had the worst year of his career last year. The absolute worst. Call it what you want. Even as a rookie coming undrafted out of Ohio State, I would have rather had that Andrew Norwell than what we saw last year. That being said, he is a former All-Pro. Players do have down years. But um, if he has, like, he restructured his deal. I love that. But if he, has a, if he has a year next year like he did last year, if 2021 is the same as 2020, Andrew Norwell probably does not play in the league for the rest of his career. He, he may get on a practice squad somewhere, but um, it, At it's that looking, point, it's like, why would you want to be on a Well, practice? he's undrafted. His rookie year wasn't that great. He had two years where he was, like, all pro. And then now he just had this year. If he has another year that's like this year, he could be out of the league. And I – and. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Well, that's what I'm. That's, that's go, you're right. It could go either way, but yeah. it just from just if it goes the other way, he's probably out of the league. But the thing is, is like I still don't get. Well, I get the slander of Andrew Norwell. I get that, but yeah, I dude, think he was so bad last year. Like I, I, I love offensive line. He let so many defensive linemen through. He could not block in the pass block. He gave up so many sacks last year. They were just so visible. Fault penalties. Dude, he was bad, dude. Well, I like, think that was I think that's the biggest problem on the offensive line is penalties. And like that's hard to deny because I mean you look at Brandon Linder too. Linder gets slander all the time 
for penalties. Brandon Linder also is like I've seen like a stat where he's allowed the le- he like allowed the sixth least amount of sacks in a certain amount of snap counts or something like that. And like Brandon Linder, I don't think should be getting as much slander as he does. And Brandon Linder's a good player. He was just injured. He was a little injured last year. Yeah, and I think this offensive line as like a whole, I get because there's there's no and no NFL team. I don't care who it is. Like you could have had what what year was it when Dallas had like that insane offensive line? Twenty seventeen. <laughs> the last couple of years, I've had a yeah. pretty good line. I guess I guess consistent consistent yeah. through those years. You know, you could have those like that great a consistency, but just from the offensive line position, there's there's not going to be a lot of people that are going to be satisfied with the play of your offensive line a hundred percent of the time, or even sixty percent of the time, I would say. And I think from what from most of the season. If you look at Brandon Linder, Andrew Norwell, Jawan Taylor, I would say that those are three really good building blocks for a solid offensive line. I would say Cam Robinson is another guy that could have potential to be a excellent player. He's coming off of an ACL tear, and he did not perform as good as a lot of people wanted him to last season. And then you got AJ Can, who's a lost fucking cause. Like that's <laughs> that's all AJ Can is. Like AJ Can's that guy. Like he's 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 out of it. But I think as far if you have two or three offensive linemen that you could really rely on, and I think at the very least the Jags have two in Linder and Juwan Taylor. Yeah, I mean you talked about the penalties. I mean the Jags were up there in offensive line penalties, but I mean Juwan Taylor was like one of the top penalty guys in the league i mean he's a rookie so we were willing to look past that but i think he had like 15 penalties which is like second or third in the league but he's a rookie so like we're okay with that because he'll learn he'll get better he was actually pretty good for a rookie offensive linemen really don't typically good, come in say. they're yeah I, offensive linemen don't typically come in and play well their rookie year it doesn't happen very often at all and dude, uh, i mean i don't okay sorry i don't mean to interrupt you but I like you anytime you want <laughs> but um do you remember how pissed a lot of people were when we didn't draft Juwan Taylor, the and then drafted. we did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was I, – look, I was a huge fan of Juwan Taylor. I did film cut-ups. I was like, dude, Juwan Taylor's actually pretty good. I, he's getting a lot of hate. And then we didn't draft him. I was like, okay. Um, yeah. I, I, I like Josh Allen, though. I mean, Josh Allen wasn't supposed to be there. Oh, yeah. So kind of a no-brainer to take Josh Allen. But when we took Juwan Taylor, and when he was fell and fell and fell, that's when I gained a little respect for Caldwell. I was like, this, this slippery guy knew what he was doing, and he ended up still getting him. John Taylor's good. I think he's going to be good. I'm excited about John Taylor. The right guard position is an absolute train wreck. Don't like Will Richardson. Don't like AJ can whatever. I like Linder injured a lot. Great player. Norwell. It's a coin flip right now. He's either 2017 Norwell or he's 2019 Norwell. Hopefully he's 2017. Cam Robinson, another coin flip. We got like three coin flips on the offensive line. That's how I'm looking at it. Not a great place to be, but the modern NFL offensive linemen, it's hard to be good. They don't make them like they used to, I guess would be what they would say. Um, so if you can get a guy that can get in front of his pass rusher and maybe you can get to, you know, I think the running game in the NFL is like slowly dying anyways. So well, the running back position, the value of right. a running back is dying significantly. I had a, I had a debate with uh, my friend Bryce the other day about this. I, you look at the Kansas city chiefs and the 49ers like i mean those guys like are expendable af both all like for the niners and the chiefs at the running back position if you think about it think about this receivers get uh, like you know jet sweeps all the time and reverses all the time yeah. running backs they basically are like receivers out of the backfield that position has pretty much become like the same thing like you got to be able to run the ball. I mean, it's all becoming the same guy. It's a it's an agile, fast guy that can catch the ball, and that's what you have to be able to be to make it in today's NFL. Um, where they line you up? There's the you know the guy like Leonard Fournette, the Ezekiel Elliott, the Saquon Barkley. Saquon Barkley is a little different because he, but those like power dudes are like kind of going by the wayside. And yeah. uh, you got to be able to be a receiver nowadays. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line on any offensive position that's a running back or receiver or tight end is you have to be able to catch the ball in space and make a move and get yards. 
that's a hundred percent facts. And I would, and I would agree with that. And I have two final questions for you, Jason, before nice. we get, before we get into some audience questions. And I think we got like three because yeah. there were a couple that we just, that just couldn't make the podcast because we try to be about, about, we try to be about as PG as we can here. PG 13, you know, we'll let some F bombs slide. Yeah. Every now and yeah. Again. yeah. Yeah. But, um, some of the questions just just did not make the cut, but we will we will take a break and answer some audience questions. But my last two questions for you are: um, How many players on the Jaguars starting starting lineup as of right now have uh, considered prove it years, and who are they? And who is going to be a leader in twenty twenty? Who's going to be a team like? a team captain, I guess, you know, the, who's going to be the leader of the defense. Who's going to be the leader of the offense um, besides Gardner Minshew. Cause I think Gardner Minshew is just kind of a too, a too obvious uh, pick there uh, who steps in the leadership off uh, role for the Jaguars and who has a proof it year for the Jags this season. Right. So I think this is pretty easy um, answer for the first part. I think everybody is on a prove it year, every single player. There's maybe two or four players that aren't. Um, I think Jawan Taylor is safe regardless. And I think LaVisca Chenault is safe regardless. Everyone else, I mean, Chark, Chark probably too. So there's your three guys on offense, Chark, Chenault, and um, Taylor. Outside of that, it could be different in 2021. It could be all changed. Defense, same exact thing. I think CJ Henderson's around for a while. Um, I think Josh Allen's around for a while. Um, and then um, Kalevon Chason. And then Schobert is on a two-year deal. So those four guys, and Schobert, honestly, not really. So those three, three on offense, three on defense, everyone else is in a prove-it year. I mean, it's the bottom line. Even the coaches and the GM, <laughs> yeah. they're all in a prove-it year. Everybody but those six guys, and that's because they were drafted within the last two years. Now, uh, something else I want to talk about, because I talked to uh, other Jason, that's just what I'll call him, other Jason in my other podcast. And um, we talked about uh, extensively for about 10 minutes, um, the CJ Henderson selection. I personally did not like it at first. First reaction, initial gut reaction. I did not like it because I thought there were better players available um, at positions of need that were the best in their class. But after a while, a lot of people have come around to CJ Henderson and have kind of came around to his playing style. What is it about uh, CJ Henderson's playing style? And what was it that made uh, Jaguar fans kind of flip the switch and say, okay, CJ Henderson was kind of a good pick. Easy answer. He came from Florida. He was projected to be a mid teen pick. Um, and he was this, and he wasn't a offensive player. Those three things that's why your gut reaction and everybody's was like, what, what are we doing? Those, cause those three reasons players from Florida haven't worked out in the first round since Fred Taylor. Um, every, you know, he was projected by analysts to be 20, 20 to get at 21 people were saying, and then um, we wanted to help mince you out. So we wanted an offensive player. So all three of those things combined to make your gut be like, ah, oh. and me, me included. Then I looked at the film and I was like, Dang. And here's the thing is this 2019 film was pretty dog. You know, it was pretty bad. Like it, he, he had a good game against LSU, even though he gave up two touchdowns. I think he played pretty well. Uh, he, he had a decent game against Georgia. Um, but 2019 was not that great. 2018 film though, he looked like the best DB in the league. So it's like, what stock do you put in 2018 versus 2019? A lot of people said he was playing not to get hurt in 2019 so that he could make it to the league and then get back to his 2018 form it depends on what side of the fence you're on. I'm choosing to believe that he's the 2018 corner and that when he comes to Jacksonville, he's going to revert back to that. And, and corner is a position of need. I mean, we are, I mean, we have no corners. Trey Herndon, shout out. That's all we have. So I think it was a position of need. The, all the reports came out about all the scouts saying like, Oh, well maybe a couple of scouts had him above Jeff Okuda that made us all feel better. We watched this film and then I think that's where we're at now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are – you. Uh, we are. I guess – well, I'll definitely be watching this, but I watch all my videos. So, yeah, I, guess, I guess we all are listening to me and Jason talk a little bit of Jaguar football. After this break, we are going to be talking about some of your questions that you guys asked us 
on YouTube and Twitter. We did get some YouTube questions. So nice. there are some real questions as well. So <laughs> stay tuned to this episode of the Treep Talks With podcast. All right, we're back and we are here to answer your questions that you guys asked on Twitter, Jaguars United, and on my YouTube community post. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to shout out Central Coast, Central Coast Climber, who's one of my uh, original followers, said that you were a solid dude, Jason. So he's, he's a fan of you. I'm glad that there's at least a couple people out there that think that. Yeah, yeah I, it's hard to think you're a solid dude when you're like average at best. If you told my friends someone thought that of me, they would laugh. Yeah, that's you. the same with me. So, so <laughs> you know, you know we're, we're perfect to be doing this podcast. So the first question on the YouTube side of things comes from Plano Jag, who is uh, one of my uh, most consistent subscribers. And it kind of goes hand in hand with the conversation we had before the break. And it is, what can the Jags do the right to steer the ship right at midseason once they find out their experiment with asking the same old line to just get better fails. Jason, I'm going to let you answer that question first. Here's what's going to happen. It's going to be about week three. The Jags are going to lose. Um, they're going to be 0-3. Shot Khan's going to fire Doug Marone. He's going to promote Jay Gruden to be the head coach. Um, Jay Gruden's going to be the head coach, and he's going to lead the team to eight or nine wins. It's going to be with, like, it's half Gardner Minshew, half Josh Dobbs. And people are going to be like, you know what? If we give Jay Gruden a good quarterback, he's the future. Shot Khan promotes Jay Gruden. He's the head coach. They draft Justin Fields because they probably won't have the top pick. And then Jay Gruden will go into 2021 with Justin Fields as a quarterback. That's how they write the ship in 2021. You heard it here first. That's what's going to happen. So my realistic answer <laughs> and something that I believe, I believe this the ship's going to get steered right because the Jaguars offensive line is going to drastically improve in 2020. I mean, there's, there's times, uh, you know, I've had you on here before where, and even me when I've been on your show where we will recall certain takes that we had down the line that ended up being right. And no one believed you. This is going to be my take. Okay. My take is, is that the Jaguars offensive line is going to be a middle of the pack group. It's not going to be a offensive line that is going to be Dallas Cowboys level to be really, really elite. But Gardner Minshew is already good at improvising. He's already good at making plays happen when they're not necessarily designed to be there. So with that mixed in with an offensive line that is going to have a better season in 2020, it's going to have a really electrifying offense. And with how the offense really improves too this season is going to be with the run game. We talked about Jake Gruden. We talked about how Jake Gruden's going to dial up a lot of run plays. And I think that's going to be a big step forward next year is how well this offensive line does uh, in the run game too. So I think this offensive line just flat out does actually get better. I know when the Jaguars hold out to do things and hold out to do certain things, 10 times out of 10, it never works. But maybe just this one time when they hold out for something, this Jaguar offensive line actually improves. Yeah, I mean, I could see where that would be a, a viewpoint. And I like that. And I hope that's what happens. Uh, I just have this gut feeling, and it's from watching film, that I don't know if Cam Robinson and Will Richardson are really going to be able to be NFL starters in the future. I hope they are, but I just what they've shown is that they, they're not. And so we're going to be depending on probably at least Robinson and probably half of Will Richardson, probably full-time Will Richardson. I just – I don't know. He just – even back to his NC State days, was a guy who just didn't really make me seem like he could do it at the next level. And um, he hasn't proven me wrong yet, and I hate saying that about guys because I want what's best for everyone. But um, I think we're going to have offensive line issues. I hope we don't. Uh, and this is me as pessimistic as I'll ever be, but that's – Yeah, and I, and I think our main issues this year is going to lie in the secondary on the defense. And I think most of the issues this year is going to be kind of a flip script, and I think a lot of it's going to be more on the defensive end with the secondary and maybe even the defensive line. Like, I mean, there's 
there's, you know, if Yannick and Gokwe plays, if Yannick and Gokwe doesn't He probably play, won't. <laughs> he probably won't. Yeah, well, yeah, you know. You, you know I, I, I don't think he will. Do you same, think he will? I really do. I have, I have this whole theory that, like, if Yan doesn't play next year, he does nothing for himself. He does absolutely nothing for himself but damage his worth, like, that much more. And it's like, there's no way he doesn't want to be in Jack. Uh, well, okay, there probably is a way. I don't want to say it like that. But, like, if he loves the game of football and he wants this to be his profession for his whole life, he's going to have to play next year. Because especially if the Jags do have a season where they go really bad, two and fourteen, four and twelve, that's gonna hurt Yan. That's gonna hurt Yan significantly. I I know like Yannick is not very popular in the Jaguar community, but it, look, let's just put ourselves in his shoes right now. Like he hasn't made enough money to be set for the rest of his life. Like think about that. Like Ngakwe is considered to be one of the best players in football. And he, has, he, he doesn't have money banked to be good the rest of his life, okay? If he plays next year and he gets a serious injury or he gets injured, he could risk being an NFL player at the top of the game, getting injured, and then having to get like a Walmart job. No, nothing personal. Yeah, no disrespect to the player. Walmart employees out there. The, the thing about it, if he sits out this year, he could make – he could say he gets one year – 10 million from a team at least he now has 10 million dollars in the bank so if you're Yannick Ngakwe how are you going to approach this season are you going to try to roll the dice and seven million dollars be set like that's a you think about it (laughs) that's all I'm saying I mean, if you think about it, Ngakwe could sit out next year, get a deal from some random team, even if it's one year, $10 million deal. At least now he has $10 million in the bank. He's on his rookie third round deal his whole career. Like, he's got to think about himself going forward. And if I'm Ngakwe, I'm sitting out too. Like, I'm, because if you get hurt next year and you don't get a second deal, you, you lose that. And the rest of your life, you know, you think about, man, if I would have sat out, I could one year I would have been set for life. He's thinking about himself. He's not thinking about Jacksonville and that's just the way that it goes. And players have that right. And they really should. So I don't blame in but it is what it is. All right. I, I I'd agree with that. I mean, there's definitely some truths that you brought up there. Now we're going to go over to the Twitter side of things and oh. Twitter for sure definitely gave us, you know, you're going to get a little bit of a nostalgia feel and you're going to get a little bit of Treb and Jason lifetime scenarios. And I'm going to let Jason take that away with the Twitter questions. Yeah, we had a question from Jack Prez um, on our Twitter and he's at Jaguars underscore Jack P. And uh, he's actually got an article coming for our website actually soon. So Ooh, sure. Adam boy. Yeah. Well, and uh, he says, if you had to go into a bar fight and you could pick any two Jaguar players, past or present, to be on your side, who would you pick? Right now, off the bat, and he said two. Two. Two? Okay, I'm picking Cinderic Marks. Okay. Easy. Okay. Cinderic Marks, dude, that's a big boy in the middle, and John Henderson. I think I think John Henderson and Cinderic Marks are two of the easiest ones to say. I mean, Austin Lane, I think, is cheating a little bit because he's like, you know. He's, that, yeah, yeah, I think so. You know, that's cheating a little bit. But Cinderic Marks, man, that's always a fun name to get brought up in the conversation. And, you know, it's just, just another opportunity for me to bring up my dog Cinderic Marks. So I'm going to say Cinderic Marks and John Henderson for the bar fight for sure. Okay, I'm going to go a little th- like throwback here on mine. And um, John Henderson, I think, is probably the answer. And if you wouldn't have said that, I would have probably said John Henderson. But for the sake of conversation, I'm going to pick two different ones. And um, I would have picked John Henderson. But in place of John Henderson, I'm going to say Greg Jones. Do you remember Greg Jones? Oh, he was a fullback yes. out of Florida State. ESPN, the magazine, did an entire article. I'm not kidding you on like his back muscles they like called it like greg jones's back and those little like greg jones like flexing talking about his workout and it was just like insane like the dude was a beast he was a running back at florida state 
was really good at Florida State, had a bunch of knee injuries, got drafted, and he's like, you know what? I can just play fullback and blow people up. And that's what he did. He went from being like a legit – like if he wouldn't have had injuries, he would have legit been like an NFL running back really good. He was really good at Florida State. Got injuries, changed his game to a fullback. Like the dude's a beast. Love him. Shout out Greg Jones. The second one, Kasim Osgood. I don't know if you remember Kasim Osgood. The special team. Kasim Osgood was the special teams gunner that was known for like causing like fights for the team. He did it when he was with the San Diego Chargers. He did it in Jacksonville. He was the guy that on kickoffs would get pushed out of bounds and he would like elbow a dude like not in the play, just holding his helmet as he's running down the field. Kasim Osgood. It, that's the guy I want with me. I want to do this going to get a cheap shot and that's going to just do a one hitter quitter, get it done, get us out of there. That's what I'm trying to do. That's a good one. Kasim Osgood. Okay. I'm going to flip this question before we get to our last question and this thing. My, my flipped question of this one is, is who are two Jaguar players that you would least like to have your back in a back in, in, in well a, i think uh, i think easy blaine gabbert is number one yeah. the dude was scared of his shadow i don't want that guy going with me into a fight that's easy i would say this is another throwback for the jags fans rj soured if the guy yeah. if the guy can't catch a ball aiming at him i don't want him trying to catch any hands aiming at me you know i don't want i don't want any of that around me i don't want any of that bad aim coordination around me so those two guys just stay away and Jalen Ramsey because he's soft Jalen Ramsey is soft although he did make I had AJ to say Green that to you him. because you're the you're one of the only people I know that still get defensive over Jalen so. I don't get defensive but I mean I wouldn't say soft I mean he like he got he like, knocked out by AJ Green he, I mean he caused AJ Green to get into a fight dude that's next that's 40 chess dude that's 40 that is 40 chess <laughs> All right, and then what's the final question to cap things off? All right, and this question I thought was good because it kind of takes us back a little bit, just like the other one did. But um, it is, which who this is from Long John Silver eight three four, and he says, who do you think is the most underrated Jaguar of all time? So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say from my time as a Jags fan. I think the correct answer to this, so me growing up as a Jags fan, I'm 21 years old currently, so I'd say prime Jags fandom for me was 2006 to now. The most underrated Jaguar player of all time to me in that time frame, and the correct answer is David Garrard. I have a whole video dedicated to why David Garrard is the best quarterback in Jaguar history, and I did that out of – out of boredom, out of Corona, but you know, I, I think David Garrard is. The, what, what's the furthest? What's the furthest game Garrard ever took the Jags to? Took second, him. second round of the playoffs. Yeah, they beat you know in twenty eight was two thousand eight or two thousand six whatever yeah. it was. But he also yeah. gave you some memorable moments though. Moments though, I want yeah. championships. Bortles at least took you to the AFC Championship. How can you? How can you say that Garrard is? better than Bortles or Brunel and both of those guys took you to AFC championship games. I'd take I'd take a mediocre Garrard season over a terrible Bortles season. Well yeah, but I mean 2017 Bortles is I would better take than any season Garrard had. Bortles, I would take 2007 Garrard over 2017 Bortles. Okay. Is that not okay. fair? Is that not is that not a fair I, Bortles I may mean, have way more yards and uh Way more. I mean, I think he had more well, touchdowns. Because he right? only played. He only had twenty touchdowns games. that year. He played like thirteen games. Yeah, okay. Well, maybe. Maybe. 12, 11 I mean, maybe games. you're right. Maybe you're right. It's hard to compare, but I mean, different style of offenses. That offense ran through the running game. Eh, yeah. I mean, yeah. All yeah. right, and then then what's your what's your right answer? Uh, I mean, the most underrated Jaguar in history is Mercedes Lewis. That's like the hundred. I I was gonna say that because he let me yeah. answer it at first, but I was like. I'm not going to steal that's the it. answer, but that's yeah. the right answer. I mean, that's it. That's the right answer. I mean, I won't – I mean, I, I go off on this soapbox all the time. The guy should be in the pride of the Jaguars. And people are like, no, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. Okay, maybe I don't, but I, mean, I watch a lot of football, watch a, a lot of Jaguars football. Mercedes Lewis was here and was never injured, 
uh, played great every year he was here. He only made the Pro Bowl one year. Well, the dude was like a extra offensive lineman or an extra receiver whenever you needed him to be that. That doesn't show up on the stats. I'm sorry, it doesn't. If you're a coach, that's not going to give you stats. But to bring a guy in and now your rushing attack is amazing and Maurice Jones-Drew can go for like 1,500 yards because you have a tight end who blocks like a tackle, that doesn't show up on the stat sheet. He deserves to be in the pride. He's super underrated. It is what it is. If you watched him, you know. I mean, he's first-round pick. I mean, you can't. it's hard to be underrated as a first-round pick, yet he is. Um, I think Maurice Jones-Drew, I mean, he was good, but I don't think people realize how good he was. I mean, he was – at one time led the league in rushing. I mean, think about that. Think about that's like having Saquon Barkley or Ezekiel Elliott on our team right now. You would be like, let's go. We got that was something. Like five eleven. Two. Yeah, exactly. Like the dude was the best at the position for a year. And um, I mean, people love him and they like him. And we could go back to the nineties and the early two thousands with guys like Tony Baselli was pretty underrated and things like that. But uh, you know, Marseille's Lewis is the right answer. Now I'm gonna I'm just gonna say this. Right now, just say a random Jaguars name that just gives you like good feelings in your heart. Dude, honestly, man, that's I really love Austin Calitro. I Austin really Calitro. love you're gonna go a little little recent, huh? Austin. I really love Cody Davis, you know, player. Dude, oh like Cody that. Davis, dude. That's the perfect name to end it on, dude. Cody fucking davis that's what our podcast is going to be named after the cody davis podcast i've been trying to lobby for this for years tree cody is, davis pot the most underrated jaguar play dude and he probably he probably has a higher average madden rating in his years in madden than ronnie harrison and jared wilson i i like to think that somewhere at some point in life cody davis is like sitting on his couch watching these videos being like <laughs> these guys yeah. talking about me like this, like this i like to think that's going on in some timeline that like cody davis is like looking down on us and and laughing at this you know what the next best get for me and you is it's to get cody davis on the podcast i can i can see i can see what i could do I, i'm I can Dude, that I can would do. be that would yeah. just 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 for me like and like and like for long time viewers of mine and your videos and just me and you that would just mean so much to both of us if we just had cody davis on the podcast we might have to wait till he's like officially retired and yeah. like isn't playing but i'm cool with that i'm a patient guy i'm i'll be around yeah no, yeah when I'm in my 30s and Jason's in his 40s, and we're fucking. When I'm an old ass man, I got gray right here. Interview Cody Davis. Cody, Cody Davis. Davis will be on the podcast. Can't wait. Deal. And then, and dude, people, people are gonna be like, I've been waiting 15 years for you guys to get Cody if, Davis. If if Cody Davis sends me a jersey, I will put it in the middle of all of my videos for the rest of my life. I'll do it. I don't care what team it is. It could be like the Patriots Cody Davis jersey. It could be the Rams Cody Davis jersey. If Cody Davis sends me a jersey, it's going on the back wall forever. I hope you know as soon as this video gets done chopped up, I'm editing that up and chopping that piece up and uploading it on – Tagging Instagram Cody Davis. And Instagram and tagging Cody Davis. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's the go for that. Yeah. But anyway, I think that's going to do it for uh, my time with Jason here. Jason, again, it's always great to have you on the podcast. I mean, uh, this is probably this is probably like our fifth episode together. And I mean, you know, lifelong friends. So, I mean, it's, it's great. It's great to have you on. I always appreciate it when you come through. I, I seriously look forward to doing videos with you. Whenever we do them, I'm just like all day. I'm like, let's go. I get all, <laughs> I get all hyped up and pumped. So, anytime you want to do some collaboration, I'm sure uh, it would be a great time. All right. Anything else you want to plug before we uh, say peace out to the people? No, just make sure to follow Treeb, share Treeb, give him some, uh, you know, support, share him out there. I mean, he's one of the OGs out there and he's one of the ones that's been faithful and you got to respect that. You got to respect, respect faithfulness. Unlike me in my last relationship and my girlfriend in this relationship. Hey, oh, <laughs> 
That's why people love Treatment Jason, because we have fun on the podcast. Again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you guys so much for listening to this. Make sure if you haven't already, you can check all the links down below for your boy. You can like me on Facebook at Troop Talks. Follow me on Twitter at Troop Talks. Follow me on Instagram at Trayvon Pixley. Hit that subscribe button. Click the bell icon to get notified every single time I drop a new video. Make sure you go follow Jason on all of his social media platforms. I'm going to let him plug those away so I don't fuck anything up. So go ahead, Jason. Just search Jaguars United. There used to be a like Brazilian youth soccer club that was like competing with us, but now we have surpassed them. And if you search Jaguars United, we will be the first thing that comes up. Congratulations! You beat it a, was a big milestone. We beat, beat a, a Brazilian, Brazilian youth soccer. Team. You know, it felt good. You know, just now we searched on YouTube that we come up now instead of them. It's, it is good. It's a good feeling small victories ladies and gentlemen that's how you get through the day thank you guys so much for listening to this podcast and as always you guys have a great rest of your day